So I'm here in Redmond in the office of Ned Pyle. Ned is in the S uh, in the file server team, or you will tell us the exact name because I I'm a little bit confused about the name is now. Yeah, and High it's availability and storage team. High availability and storage yes. team. Okay. So Ned, talk. Please tell us what are you doing here at Microsoft, and how long have you been here, for example? Uh, as a program manager here, I'm managing a new feature called Storage Replica, as well as a bunch of existing features like DFSR and File Server and SMB and a bunch of other little knobs and things. I've been at Microsoft for 10 years. I've been here as a program manager in Redmond for a little over two years, two and a half years. Oh, and uh, you told us you are uh, responsible for storage replication. I was quite surprised when Microsoft announced, and you, you did it at uh, Tech at Europe, I, I guess, officially, that Microsoft will bring a storage replication because this is a feature that, that is there in very expensive Zahn storage system, so it's not new, but what's really new is Microsoft is doing it in a file server. Yes, I mean, uh, we are very late to this. It's been around for 20 years, you could argue, maybe more than 20 years. But um, our goal is to, what I like to say is that my goal is to make it a commodity. Yeah. To make it something where it's not millions of dollars and requires very specialized equipment and is extremely proprietary and is endlessly a la carte with its features. We wanted something that would help the vast majority of customers and have it be part of Windows itself. Mm -hmm. Um, and the goal is to finally do synchronous block replication here at Microsoft, which we have never done before. Yeah, so the use case for storage replication, for us to get to that, what is the use case normally for a customer t who, do, who does storage or synchronous block replication? Why they do that? I mean, it's all about disaster recovery. Mm -hmm. It's about um, saying that uh, no matter what, if I lose this site, this data center, this building, this campus, this floor of the building, whatever, I want to make sure that I have those those bytes and blocks somewhere else. And um, it's not like a backup. A lot of customers like to think of their replications uh, software as a backup. And you shouldn't think of it that way because uh, if you delete everything, that will get replicated too. That's not a very good backup. Yeah. What's really designed for is everything's working fine and then suddenly uh, the server where this all was is pulverized or explodes or electricity goes out uh, or it floods and it's not coming back anytime soon maybe not coming back ever and the goal of storage replica is to give you that ability to have that data go to another server or another node in a cluster or another cluster altogether somewhere else besides the rack that you are already in preferably somewhere else far away miles and miles away, but I suspect most customers will probably do it between buildings or campuses where the network infrastructure is very easy to have, lots and lots of bandwidth and very low latency. We have some physical limitations, we have some physics limitations mm -hmm. that we have to adhere to from uh, Mr. Einstein. So, um, speed of light. Yes, the <laughs> speed of light, and, uh, and the speed of light in our case is actually quite restricted by things like the atmosphere and the attenuation of signals and the fact that optic cables have very degraded signals as their distance gets longer. Uh, so, it, in reality, even though if we say, and right now our recommendation would be your round trip is say uh, at five milliseconds or less is a good place to, to, to run our software. Um, that might be for you 100 kilometers, it might be 10 kilometers, it's really going to depend. And we give you now in this next release of the product in the technical preview too, even some tools to test and measure and tell you before you ever set up our product if it's going to work for you or not. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned five milliseconds is uh, uh, a value you should not go beyond that. So if we do synchronous storage replication, that is why. So my viewers have to understand if, uh, why is it so important that you have a low latency uh, connection between the two sides or yes. the two servers? I mean, latency is the secret killer of application performance. Everybody, and, we're, and we are very guilty of this, we talk very much about IOPS and yeah. the massive IOPS. We talk about two million IOPS on scale file server and we have lots of very interesting brochures about that. But the, the really important thing to me in the replication world is the latency because at every layer in this stack of your application being at the very top, 
and the storage being at the very bottom, every delay in there adds up to the application performing or seeming to perform worse and worse and worse to the end user, the guy who's actually making money for your company, and that's the important thing. Mm -hmm. um, or to the point where it doesn't work at all. I mean, some applications and certain businesses have sensitivities to latency that translate into money. You know, you can think of like a stock exchange. Yeah. Um, and some just have applications that don't like to be told to wait very long. Um, you can think of like databases. Yeah. So our goal is to be as um, as less intrusive as possible in this stack. So we make sure that our product storage replica is very fast. And then we also try to guide you in making sure that you don't add uh, it, you know, other elements of your infrastructure that as part of the whole solution make you slow even though we're fast. We can't be any faster than your network, your storage, or whatever. Yeah. So um, I saw some diagrams how it works. Uh, you normally you write to a disk yes. and or a volume or a partition, and uh, with synchronous storage replication, um, the data has also be written to the other side. Yes. So maybe are you able to short uh, to draw a short uh, uh, diagram of Absolutely. that? So if you think of your entire setup as being. Uh, two sites, we'll just have a little river, and this is uh, New Jersey over here, and this is Manhattan over here, or New York. Yeah. And we think of this as the Hudson River, which would not be blue, it would be very brown and disgusting. Okay. Uh, we would have, let's, let's, we'll talk about a very simple, simple, simple setup of just two servers in a stretch cluster. We have a lot of scenarios here that yeah. we support, um, server to server or cluster to cluster, or you can take one cluster and split it in half and have half the nodes in one spot and half the nodes in the other spot. It's called mm. stretch cluster. Stretch cluster. And the storage is not accessible for one node outside of his own site. Mm -hmm. It's just replicated with SR. So if I have on him some storage, uh, this will be like say my data volume and this will be my log volume. Mm -hmm. The log volume is used for us to contain the writes. I'll get to this in a second. And it can be for many data volumes. It could be a one-to-many relationship. But as I'm here working in uh, downtown Manhattan in my, my ritzy office and I'm working on an application, that application writes an I.O. down to the disk. I mean like all applications do. Yeah. And ordinarily, it would simply return back saying, yes, I wrote. I've written it. Yeah. Yes. In the case of storage replication, an, uh, an extra series of steps happens. Yeah. So instead of writing right to the data disk and be calling it a day, we write and intercept. This is where SR is intercepting the IOs okay. to the log volume. And this log volume has logs on it. This log volume is... Uh, another recommendation for us very fast. Should be maybe an SSD or an array, array of SSD. RAID, flash, yeah. NAND, all the types of various devices and things. Whatever you could support by Windows. Because again, we don't know and don't care what your storage is. As long as your cluster is happy or as long as your server is happy, we're happy. Okay. Okay. So it's got writ written to the log. Okay, written to the log. And that I.O. is sent across the network to this log yeah. on this other server, which captures it and just responds back saying, okay. So we had step one, two, three, and four is now respond. The acknowledgement that the, yes. the, uh, the block write has, yes. placed, has been placed successfully on in the, in the storage yes. system. So your application is happy, and yeah. that repeats 80 bajillion zillion times forever, right? Yeah. And what's happening in the background here is we're writing to the log, and you're saying, well, that's fine, where's my data going, is every, you know, in the background, very constantly, we are flushing from yeah. this log into the actual data volume as well. And this is happening in the background. So what's interesting about this setup is under a lot of uh, we also do something called write aggregation, where we take a bunch of these write, as many as we can gather at once, and we're sending them across in these uh, relatively large SMB3 packets. I'll talk more about that in a second. But we're aggregating or, um, you know, basically bulk sending these writes. And we're doing it from our log volume, 
which has the interesting side effect of if your network's good and your log volumes are good, you actually can see faster I.O. performance. Because it's not going to Because it's not going to the HDD, it's going to the right. SSD. Yeah. So if you didn't have tiering, or if you weren't using tiering, uh, this would be sort of like having an extra layer of tiering added by us, but it's even more so because we do aggregation, which Windows doesn't do. Okay, cool. It doesn't exist in Windows. We wrote our own. So you can accidentally, in some circumstances, be faster yeah. than not replicating, which is hard to imagine or even believe. But trust me, we actually have the I proof. heard you said that in a presentation. <laughs> yes. Well. It's, it doesn't always happen. And in the end, if you've got anything else that's particularly slow here, you're going to be as slow as the yeah. slowest yeah. part, right? Um, so what's interesting is we're doing a couple of things here to save ourselves a lot of work and to increase the reliability of the system. One is all of this traffic is using SMB 3.1.1. That's new. Yeah. Now we don't care about this part, we just care about 3. Yeah. We use SMB 3 so we can get multi-channel support. Multi -channel, we can uh, get encryption. SMB Direct. We get RDMA. Yeah. SMB Direct. I love those features. Those are great features and I love them because they just work without me doing anything. So when I set up my my test environment over here, I don't go like I would with my third-party SAN replication and worry about setting up a special fiber channel network, networks probably, especially when you're going into dark fiber networks across distances, that starts getting a little complicated. And I don't care about setting up multiple HBAs mm -hmm. and binding things together in order to get bandwidth. I just keep adding NICs and I keep getting more bandwidth. And as long as my pipe in the middle can take it, I'll add more there. Mm -hmm. And if I use RDMA, so we have a setup in our lab from using Mellanox equipment, which is InfiniBand RDMA, which ordinarily has a range limit of about about five meters, because that's, oh, the, that's, length, small. that's hey. the length of the cables that yeah. they make. Yeah. That's it. That's the point of it. Um, but they also sell a device called a Long Haul Metro X switch, a 66 something, I forget the name, of which we have some. So what we test with in one of our test labs is we have a 10 kilometer spool yeah. of fiber of, of fiber optic cable. Yeah. And we plug into this Mellanox on each end. And so we're using SMB3, SMB direct, and we're using fiber optic cable in between. And even though we're going 10 kilometers, the entire trip is actually in this space of about one square meter because we have a spool of cable on top of a rack. Yeah. We actually go 10 kilometers and at this 10 kilometer range, I mean, if you were pinging something 10 kilometers away over TCP IP, you'd probably expect to see, with all the router hops and switches and stuff, you know, maybe like a one millisecond response time, maybe a little bit less than that. And in this environment, going 10 kilometers, you know, going half a mile, yeah. we're getting a point O2 latency. Point o oh, milliseconds. That's great. I mean, it's effectively no latency. Yeah. Zero latency. It's as, as if we were all on the same rack. Yeah. So this explains, you have here the latency, not with this fancy new uh, InfiniBand stuff. Normally you no. don't have that. You have Ethernet between yes. the data centers and as more far away they are, yes. the the latency grows. So this is very important that yes. uh, this is the limitation of the of how far away they can be. Yeah, this is the absolute number with Einstein of a right. of a round trip that you can take and be under and be at five milliseconds. Yeah. You'd have to be in a vacuum. Yeah. And you'd have no a cable. No cables. No right. cables that yeah. could possibly be causing any kind of problems with the signal itself. You'd have to be somehow. You're basically sending, you know, photons yeah. in outer space. So that's the distance. You know, that's just the speed of light at that point. Yeah. In reality, once you go start going through all this equipment and gear and stuff, most customers usually see like that's probably the <laughs> limits of their range. And for the purposes of a disaster. Uh, and synchronous replication, that is more than enough. Yeah. I, I did a study, and I'll talk about it at Tech Ready here in a few weeks, of, of the data centers that operated in Manhattan during the Sandy Storm. And there was about 10 um, service providers and hosters, you know, for public hosting who operated in that zone mm -hmm. where the flooding occurred. Mm -hmm. And half of them went down because they had no DR. Mm -hmm. 
So um, this is a synchronous replication. Yes. I'm happy to know there is something else. You have the, also the possibility to asynchronous yes. replicate. Yes. So what is the difference? The big difference here of us doing asynchronous, I'll get rid of this little guys here, is that instead of going one, two, two three, three four, four, we go one, two. So the application writes to the log. The log responds back to the application. I mean, the application doesn't know he's writing to a log. He thinks he's writing to a disk. And then in the background, now we do the other steps. It's written to the log. Yes. And, okay. To the log and back and all that stuff happens, and the destaging still happens. And the whole point of this is uh, this delay of travel is now eliminated. Yeah. Now, what you'll see here, and what you might think of when you know of other uh, replication products is they don't continuously replicate. They replicate, replicate, you know, they, they, they collect up a bunch of, of, you know, block changes or whatever, and they snapshot and they send the snapshot, which means it happens not continuously. It happens every five minutes or 15 minutes or whatever you configure it. So you can um, potentially you can lose data. You can potentially lose data. Yeah. You can lose data with ours as well. But the interesting thing is because we continuously replicate, your your RPO window, your actual amount of time where you're out of sync with us is considerably less. Okay. Because we are still operating under the assumption that you care about it being pretty close to being in sync. So we continuously replicate in that direction. So we might say instead of being say 15 minutes out of date, like certain you know, other products that I could name but won't, you might only be two or three seconds out of date. Mm -hmm. And right. then you can also, I don't want to cut you off, but you can also replicate, you can create regular volume snapshots yeah. on this volume that you're replicating, which themselves will get replicated. Yeah. Which means that if you want that kind of checkpoint behavior of saying, well, I don't care about the last five seconds, I just care that I get an app consistent snapshot every 15 minutes. All I do is schedule VSS to run then, and it's just going to flow along with it. I can, when I have my disaster, hopefully I don't ever have my disaster, if I have my disaster, this volume comes back online, I restore whatever the last VSS snapshot that made it, mm -hmm. and I'm back in business. So I get to, I get to have uh, my cake and eat it too, as we say in America. Mm -hmm. So um, if I'm a customer and I have to decide, do I synchronous replication or asynchronous replication? Yes. Because the data also gets here. Where, what should I use or what are the, the, the points where I should look at? Yes. Because synchronous, in my uh, assumption, and you uh, told us that, is slower than asynchronous replication. The, the application gets uh, the write back very, very fast. Yes. And with the synchronous, it gets uh, the OK from the storage system that's, that the data is written after it's synchroni synchronized to the other log file. Yes. Okay. It's money versus performance. In the, in the end equation of almost every answer I'll give you, it's money versus performance. Yeah. So if I you know, look at it from this perspective of sync, versus async. Uh, this one has a recovery point objective of zero. It will never lose any data, mm -hmm. ever. This one, I mean, you could get incredibly lucky, but odds are you will always have something greater than zero data lost, always something, which yeah. may be OK. Now, that's a good, and that, you might argue, is a bad. Yeah. Another, um, but if you take the reverse, this one right here, your application's performance is now tied directly to the entire, not just your I.O. stack, but your network and somebody else's I.O. stack. This is very likely to be slower than this, mm -hmm. just in real life terms. And then finally, the, the cost of doing business on something synchronous is that you can't get too far before, no matter what, no matter how good we are, physics steps in, and you're going to start seeing unacceptable latency. So if you need to go range, and you know, 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 kilometers is not enough, well, that's pretty good. I mean, the range limitation on this is non-existent. You can go as far as you want. You can go okay. thousands of miles. You can go geographic. We don't care. Absolutely do not care. Do you have fast networks between 
So you, within one, uh, you would say that I do have to have fast networks, except that if you can back up your stuff with good logs, and you have enough bandwidth, even if your networks aren't particularly fast, but you are able to, you know, make a good judgment about how much data can I afford to lose, because we are totally consistent the way we write. If we lose the server, we're not going to end up with half an I/O over here or anything. Like this machine's going to be good. The question is, how much can I afford? Again, back to the money price or the money, uh, you know, aspect. How much can I afford to lose before it's too expensive? Even if I recover, like it will be too bad. It'll be too late. Mm -hmm. You know, if I find what we what we did in the end is we wrote a tool called test SR topology and it goes through and you can run it without even configuring SR in fact we want you to run it before you set up SR mm -hmm. so that you can decide you know this particular setup I have with the IOs that I put on there every day is this one a good candidate for async or sync or anything maybe nothing um, you can run this tool and tell it just run for like three hours or run for two days or whatever give me a report when you're done and I will let I.O. happen the way it's supposed to, or maybe I generate some I.O., who cares? And it gives you an HTML report saying, you know, if you, with this network and this I.O. and these particular log sizes that you could choose from, this is how long you can survive being down, uh, where your secondary is offline, where we can recover the I.O.s and send them back over. This, this will tell you your whole story of disaster recovery preparedness and performance in just mm -hmm. one report. So um, this is great stuff. Uh, you mentioned there are three different scenarios. You have server to server. Yes. You have cluster to cluster. Yes. And you have a stretched cluster. Yes. I think the, I would say the most interesting for me when I see it is the stretched cluster scenario. Because I'm a Hyper-V MVP, as you yes. may know. And for virtualization, um, I think the stretched cluster is, uh, is the, the most important one. Right. Yeah, uh, maybe you can um, el elaborate a, a little bit about that, uh, where, where, what, how it looks, and what's important in that scenario. Sure. One one thing I think is very important for the people: uh, the volume is only accessible on one side. Yes. So. Um, uh, at first, when I thought, oh, where is the volume? I, I can. I, I thought I can could wrote in from both sides in the same volume. That's not the case. Not the case. But you can, I guess, have some volumes here online and some volumes here, and there Absolutely. are replicas. Okay. Absolutely. So we look at it. We'll look at it from a, a, a four-node stretch cluster perspective. That's probably the the. Uh, probably the most bang for your buck as far as high availability and disaster recovery without being too expensive, okay? You could do two node, you could do 64 node, we don't care. We follow the rules of cluster, we don't make our own rules yeah. in a storage replica. Yeah. So these are sharing, you know, some classic shared storage in this particular scenario. And that's being replicated in this direction for this set of storage. So if I have this is one stretch cluster yeah and I have VMs running and they're running against the storage theoretically they could be this is it could be CSV as well and if you want you could have them on other nodes and they're gonna be yeah, but normally this would be a scale out file server. well ordinarily it would be a scale out file server except that we don't recommend we can't stop you but we really don't recommend it we probably will not support in this release a disaggregated setup like um, uh, scale out file server with, right. with compute cluster yeah. in a single stretch cluster. Yeah, we can do a converged cluster. So compute with its own storage is perfectly okay because the unit is going with it. If you do scale out though, the problem is if this is a scale out file server, it only has one share. Yeah, you have to and have I could be coming in from all over the place and then redirecting eventually back yeah, to the one that actually uh, okay. writes the data. Right, I didn't thought. No, it's okay. That's okay because we have an answer for that. And the answer for that is if you really have, if you've drank the Kool Aid on using scale out file server in a cluster, that's fine. Do second one a second cluster yeah unreplicate that and do a second hyper v which you don't even really need to replicate right i mean it's just it all it does is point to the data that's all there and replicate this have your compute clusters as well and then what we will do is provide for you through azure site recovery 
a way to orchestrate all this so that when you have your disaster, you go into Azure and press a button. And it will look at these and look at these and says, well, these are gone. These are here. All these IP addresses are all different in this site. Let me fix that. And you know, all these paths are different. Let's please fix that up. And then bring the VMs back online over here. Mm -hmm. The data is already there. It's just orchestrating what needs to be done. This could be asynchronous or synchronous. But we go back to the scale out. Uh, sorry, if we go back to the stretch cluster. In a single cluster, I can have my VMs running here, and I can lose this node, keep going. I can lose both these nodes, and the VMs will simply come online on this side. On the other side. And uh, what's because interesting... Because the storage is replicated. Because it's replicated. But that's only... I'm, I'm taking the very simplest case here. It is perfectly acceptable for you to add some more available storage, configure it with SR, and replicate, and the, replicate other in the other direction and make this into basically uh, a policy managed and admin managed uh, active active yeah. very quasi active yeah. active because you're doing a lot of work yeah because yeah otherwise it would be active here stand by there yeah. and so we can use the compute power here also yeah. of course if something fails not all will fit on one side that is so the possibility is so if you end up over provisioning stuff so that it's only got enough during the day yeah. for everybody and but that's the thing about disasters is a, most machines running in a company are frankly yeah. uh, not that important compared to the handful that handle things like all the money, the transactions, the orders, the payroll, the whatever. Those ones you protect and you make sure you've got provisioning for them. And if we have VMM in here, or if we have VMN in here, we can even say, you know, these volumes are more important than other volumes because they're replicated, and machines that are more important than other ones, maybe in this setup I don't replicate all of them at all. Yeah. Maybe I have some that don't replicate. And yeah. you know, if I have a bunch of VDI solutions, do I care that much about a bunch of workstations not surviving a disaster? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Do I care about a, a particular small set of workstations that are used by the executives? Probably yeah, yes. yes. So you know, you target and tailor what you're yeah. going to do. In the past, you, you really had to only choose the most critical things because you're using a third party replication product at the sand layer, uh, you had to justify spending hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. Yeah. Now you'll get to sort of choose what you feel is important or not. It won't come down to money. It'll come down to just, yeah. you know, topology and networking and storage and your preferences. Yeah. One last thing, and then uh, we have talked a lot about that. That's great. One last thing, um, the, the storage I use has not to be storage spaces. No, no, it no. It can be. I personally don't have access to any JBOD, so I have never run SR myself on a storage space. I'm yeah. a terrible person. I only use iSCSI, yeah. something else our team owns, um, because it's iSCSI that I have in my lab. Yeah, because so, otherwise you would be out of yes, the picture. What you can actually do with us is you can replicate on a JBOD yeah. with spaces. Or you can use your existing SAN, yeah. or you can use iSCSI targets, which is what I use, yeah. just because I'm broke and poor all the time. <laughs> um, and if I don't use clustering, these are, these are really necessities of clustering, yeah. right? If I have a line here that says, and I can also use local storage if it's not a cluster, or if you start talking about uh, Klaus's crazy spaces shared nothing configuration, yeah. Um, which doesn't have any of these things. It has spaces, JBODs, but they're actually local or maybe just spaces local. As long as you do cluster to cluster, that's fine for us as well. So this is typically a standalone server. So if you just have some disks, SATA disks or you know, SAS disks in a server, I mean, in a VM, if you take a virtual machine, which we only recommend you do for eval purposes, right? You don't want to run SR inside of VMs around stuff, we want or you to, to do play it, with it, to play with it and evaluate, we want you to use real hardware for SR, the infrastructure layer, we don't. Um, but you can certainly just replicate from like the D drive to the D drive in some VMs and we don't care in the slightest. Mm. What we really care about is the, as you talked about before, the geometry and the size and making sure that we have the adequate space. So, so that's, I, a, that's important, yes. the ge geometry should must be the same on both yes. volumes. Yes. So that's, that's important. To yes. So, so maybe the size, if it's two, five, five, twelve uh, byte blocks or yes. 4K blocks, that's important. You certainly cannot replicate between an old 5K, uh, 5, uh, 12K disk 
block disc and an, or a 512 byte disc and a new 4K block disc because the blocks will never look the same. Once we replicate, they will never ever so match. So never work. Said Microsoft is late to the storage. Oh, very, yeah. very late. I would disagree with you because <laughs> here are so much possibilities and adding to that you have a great storage replication protocol SMB. Yes. You can scale it yes. as as you like. You're not limited to one TCP IP stream between the data center. So this has so much potential and I think it's a very great solution. The, the beauty of coming into something late is you get to learn all the mistakes that somebody did before yeah. you and you get to innovate in the areas that now haven't been innovated in at all rather than having to show up and, and, and have a perhaps a flawed or iterative approach that takes yeah. a while to get good. Like for example, the interesting thing you see about TCP IP just then or the single connection, I have found a number of SAN replication products that replicate using a proprietary protocol. They usually just use TCP IP and then they layer something of their own definition over that. And if they want to add things like multi-channel and things that we've done or use standards, they cannot. The most uh, terrifying thing for me is that I find that uh, I've not found any of them that implement security. Yeah. So it's not even a question of saying, do they implement good or bad security? They don't implement security. I found one where you simply provide each array with an IP address. That's it. That's the security. Yeah. So you're sending a data volume with every the most critical important information in your company over the network unencrypted to anything which shows up with the IP address. Anybody That's could show up with IP address. Man in the middle attack, you could. Man in the middle it. attack, you wouldn't even know about it. It's the most. It's ridiculous. Whereas with SMB, we have encryption, signing that the protocol of SMB3 itself is now five years old, it's extremely stable, it's very fast, and you get all those benefits of things that are baked in that you kind of get along with for free. And like SMB3.11, we've made a lot of the changes we've made in this release were just around performance and optimization, and it's just even better than it was before. Yeah. And you mentioned, I think the price point of that is a whole other thing than in a, in a barn array. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, not decided yet. I mean, you know, yeah, but uh, normally, as I understand, Microsoft, this will maybe a part of Windows Server, not a separate product. So, uh, um, oh, yeah, it won't be some like some special add-on. It won't be an add-on that you buy and you download separately. It will certainly be in Windows. Where in Windows and which, and SKU, which SKU and, and when you can run it inside. We haven't even figured that yeah. out yet. Matt, this was very valuable for me. I learned a lot and I watched you, your tech ad session and so on and uh, uh, great information. Thank you very much for that and uh, I'm looking forward to Ignite where I see, see maybe more of that. It'll be great. I'm from Chicago. We'll make sure we go out. I know all the best places to go. That's cool.